Hi there, I'm Matthew Woody. Welcome to Ramblings of an Undiscovered Author, and today I'm joined by author of Enemy in the Mirror and The Offspring and the Sea Wolf, Mark Scott Smith. Had a really good chat with him. I hope you enjoy it. Let's get to it now. All right, I am joined by Mark Scott Smith, author of Enemy in the Mirror and The Offspray and The Sea Wolf. First of all, Mark, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate the time. Good morning, Matthew. Um, now, just a quick scan of your of your both your website, which is linked in the description, and your Twitter. It does reveal quite the love of history. I think. Where did this uh, Where did this love come from? <laughs> I'm not really sure. You know, I had a career in academic medicine, and I wasn't really a war buff or historical buff before I retired to the Oregon coast and I, I came across some really interesting stories about Japanese attacks on Oregon during World War II and I thought how fascinating so that started me researching these things and then I got into I had done a lot of writing uh, academic writing but not creative writing and so I wanted to become a creative writer of historical fiction perfect now, I see that you've spent a little bit of time throughout your life in both uh, Japan and Germany, and both of these are settings in your, in your two books. Now, I'm assuming that's not a mistake, that the, the two countries that you spent some time in are settings in the book. Yeah, that's correct. I, um, I was an exchange student in Germany. I spent my junior year in Munich, and I also was in the Army uh, in Frankfurt for about four years during the Vietnam days. And then my wife and I spent many uh, years, actually for 10 years, we went for a month to Chiapas, Mexico, every year to work in a hospital. So I'm kind of a intermediate speaker of uh, both German and Spanish. I want to emphasize intermediate, so I can use Google Translate and I know when it's making a mistake or not, you know, to help me out. So that's why I kind of throw in a lot of those uh, terms and things in the book. Fair enough. And now, have you been to Japan or did I did I misread that you would had spent time in Japan? Yes, I for the first book, the, uh, the Enemy in the Mirror, which is about the Japanese attacks, I, I, I want to emphasize my whole point is really to talk about both sides in a war, so to try to understand the combatants of both sides. So I chose, um, there was a submarine that attacked you know, the Oregon coast, so I chose a young man on the submarine as a junior officer. And then I said to myself, well, where did he come from that would be the mirror image of where I live? And I live in the northwest of America on the Oregon coast, and if you know Japan at all, that's Hokkaido. And the island of Hokkaido, which is north of, you know, of the main islands, is, is so much like uh, the northwest of Oregon. It's real green and mountains and ocean and so on. So we traveled there several times. Uh, I don't like to write without actually seeing what I'm writing about. And I actually had to set my wife about walking the path of my characters, and I'd take photographs in... You know, then I would be able to describe later on exactly what it was. It was in the environment and so on, you know. Yeah. That... yeah we've been to a couple of times in Japan. Okay. It does really come across in the books, and I do want to explore that in just a second. But I want to ask, first of all, of all the places you've been, do you have any favorites? Any that sort of stand out as just like fun places to go or sort of had like a like an impact on you? Because I know there's some places, especially... Uh, in Europe that was sort of related to the Second World War. I mean, obviously, um, Alcatraz is the obvious, not Alcatraz, uh, Auschwitz is the, is the is the standout one, but is there any have been any favorite places or memorable places that you've been? Oh, gee, it's hard to say. You know, I mean, I, I lived in Munich for a year, and I love that city uh, in Germany. Uh, I thought Japan was just a lovely country. People were very courteous and polite. A great place to go as a tourist, by the way, because people are very helpful downside is nobody speaks English <laughs> and I, I had a problem there because uh, you know I would look at the signs and I couldn't read them because the script wasn't uh, you know uh, our script either um, so I would say the, the traveling in Japan uh, and the um, just the style that they have the fashion the way they they do gardening and structures and stuff just lovely you know so I'm kind of into it that way but you know in my heart Matthew um, I'm a white Anglo guy who's in my heart Hispanic. I love the culture of Latin America. I, I love Mexico. Um, it's just, I'm sad right now about all the violence going on, but it's just such a wonderful, a warm country. Yeah, no, it, it, you sort of, you get that vibe. If you ever see any travel shows from, from Mexico, you do get the vibe from the locals that that's the sort of, that's the, is the sort of place it is. Now, Enemy in the Mirror, which is, I did read and I really, really enjoyed it. So everybody, it's definitely that one I can recommend um, highly. It is extensively researched, and I'm assuming it's the same thing for the Osprey and the Sea Wolf. 
how long did it take? I mean, you did mention that you had when you retired, you sort of got into the, an interest in that. But how, so, how long did it take to sort of research each of those books? Because some of the the detail in there is just incredible. Yeah, I gotta say, I, I, I'm sort of a plotter. Uh, you know, I'm the kind of guy that will sit down here and look at a paragraph for a couple of hours before I tune it the way I want, which is the opposite of what most writing teachers teach you to do. You know, you're supposed to put it down and then go back and edit, but I don't. I spend a lot of time, and I spend a lot of time on research online, reading books in the library, but also I try to find experts that I can communicate with and make sure that I'm getting it right. Uh, so that first book actually took me quite a while, uh, about four years in total, to put it together. And the second book, uh, similar. And I've now just started on my third book, which is going to be about the Korean War. I started the research. It's going to be about the Korean War. So I've got to go to Korea and Japan and so on, you know, <laughs> again, to research that. Well, the way things are looking, you might have an end to the Korean War to write about, too, if, uh, you know, if the way things are looking right now. Now, your books, they're written from the perspective of characters on both sides of the war, which I found really effective because it kind of keeps both sides humanized, especially, um, I mean, the Japanese were known for some extreme tactics, let's say, in the war. Now, did you find it difficult to write from both perspectives and sort of staying neutral as well, not sort of wanting or not sort of becoming, dis not disliking, I guess, one side more than the other? Yeah. I don't think I found it too difficult. Um, I tried to choose, of course, I chose characters that I that had sort of honorable positions, you know, like a pilot or a U-boat commander. Or um, I'll tell you where I do uh, think that I'm, I might have a problem, and that is I was trying to write from the point of view of a woman. It's a little harder for me uh, just being a man. Uh, and my wife's very good at this and kind of one part of my editors that helps me with it. But in those, those cases, I sometimes, I just hope I'm kind of getting it right. But with the men, you know, I really kind of identify and then sort of culturate myself into where their culture is and see if I can come from that point of view. Fair enough. And is there something that you want people to take away from your books? Is it sort of the understanding of both sides? Or what, what would you hope that people take away from, from your books when they finish them? Yes, I think that's the point, Matthew. I, I, my, I, call, my, uh, I call my first book Enemy in the Mirror. I also call my website that Enemy in the Mirror. And I think my thesis is that we are all basically the same. We have people that we love. We have a country that we love and so on. And we might be in a fascist dictatorship or something else, but we're still kind of, you know, citizens of that nation feel that way. So uh, I think we tend to uh, demonize our, our enemies in wartime. And it's maybe necessary to kill somebody. You've got to demonize them, you know. But I think that's not the reality. I think the, the, re the reality is that there is a lot of... <laughs> I don't want to sound like President Trump too much, but there was a lot of good people over there, you know, <laughs> on that side. But I think there were a lot of uh, just ordinary people like us. And I try to make my characters, like, I think the, the recent one, the German U-boat commander, is a good example. He's a patriot, and he's fighting for the fatherland, for Germany, and he's sinking our allied ships and killing our people uh, for fighting for his country. But he's not a Nazi, and he's very concerned about the kind of brutal... Uh, crude uh, leadership in his country at that time and what it's affecting, how it's affecting his children and his family and so on. But he'll fight to the death for his country. And I think that's pretty pretty realistic of a lot of people in wartime. Yeah, because no one thinks they're the bad guys, right? Everybody thinks that they're, they're on, in the right. Even, even I mean, look, if, I'm sure you've had the same thing if I'm in a fight with my wife. I always think I'm right. It's only sort of after the fact you're like, no, maybe not. But <laughs> at the time, you, you know, you think you, you're in the right. Yeah. And it's true what you say about people, you know, they do always sort of have that heartfelt, like, thing for their country. Because I met um, sort of some Syrian and Iraqi refugees at different points in the last 10 years. And they still love their country. They know that it's a bit of a mess and that it's not somewhere they want to be right now. But it's still it's still their country and they still won't have anyone talking badly about it. Because it's, you do, you do just sort of have that natural jaw, I guess, to your own country and your own people. So... I think that you did a really good, as I said, I've read Enemy in the Mirror, and you did a really, really good job sort of portraying that about the Japanese, I thought. Um, now, you did mention that you did have the uh, book for the Korean War in the pipeline. Is there any sort of any yeah. any sort of plot snippets you can give us without giving too much away? Yeah, well, you know, I, I, if you ask people uh, uh, what they know about the period of time between 1945 and 1950, in other words, the end of World War II, in the beginning of the Korean War, people really don't know what was going on during that period. It's not very clear. Um, 
<laughs> McCarthy was the Red Scare here, and McCarthyism and so on came on the late part of the 40s. But just where were people? So I think part of my uh, idea for this book is to raise the consciousness of the reader of what was going on, not only in, in, in America, and, and uh, uh, but also in Korea, and China, Japan, and Russia at that time, because all these players were involved in this, um, uh, what we thought was the domino effect, you know, that the communism was going to take over the world, that we didn't stop it here, and so on. So uh, I think my whole point would be to try to point out um, uh, what was really going on. And let me just say, from the Korean point of view, I'm just starting to research this, but the more I research, the more I realize what huge errors uh, the Americans particularly made in occupying uh, that country, not understanding that Korea was coming from uh, uh, almost uh, you know half of a century of colonialism by Japan, um, and so when we come in after the war, defeating Japan, and we actually reinstituted a lot of the same uh, leadership that they'd had under the Japanese, even to their dreaded police, which is a lot of like the Gestapo. Yeah, a little bit like like cultural blindness i guess which i think you know you go back through history and that's a there's a lot of of cases of that i think uh, now do you ever see yourself oh go ahead sorry no no please I was say, it's all these errors that were made by us uh and i uh, said it helps to kind of understand what the other side's thinking you know wait a minute we just you know i thought the americans were going to be the liberators here and in fact, they're kind of extending the colonialism. And so you can see where there would be some alternative views that would arise. Yeah, and I think, like I said, I, I, I'm looking forward to reading it when you, know, when you do finish it, because you, and, and I mean, you do a really good job of, of showing both sides. So if, if you can do that again, which I'm sure you can, it's going to be a really, really interesting read, I think. Now, do you ever see yourself writing a, a book that's sort of not, not war-related, or not sort of World War II or Korean War-related in this case, or is it that, that's, that's, what, that's your thing, that's what you, you find interesting, and so that's what you write best? Well, you know, my wife asked me that question. <laughs> we talk about war a lot. But, you know, I want to, I want to say again, I wasn't really a war buff uh, for most of my life. Uh, I think I'm more like... Um, an American who's coming to a conscious awareness of the, how much more complicated things were than I thought when I was younger. I mean, I until I was a teenager, I was pretty clear that, you know, we really did have the righteous position in the world and we're saving democracy and doing everything for the good of the world. And, uh, and then I started realizing, whoa, you know, I guess Vietnam was a big turnaround for a lot of us. But I started realizing, and don't get me wrong, I'm not an America basher. I'm very proud to be an American and I love this country. And, uh, but I think um, it's really important to understand that we also have been operating in a, in a certain way that's not been helpful. So I think what happened, I gradually realized as I was writing these things, what I'm really writing about is the wars that have occurred in my lifetime. So I was born in 1942, so in, in you know World War II, and the Korean War, I was like 10 years old, and then, uh, you know, then Vietnam, basically, and then some other small ones. But... I always say, if I live long enough, I'll get to Vietnam, but it takes me, you know, five years or so to get a book out there. I'm 76 now, so we'll see what happens. I got Vietnam in the pipeline for sure. So I think the answer to the question is, yeah, I've got to pretty much keep writing about, about wartime consciousness and try to look at both America's point of view and the enemy's point of view. Well, if, if, it's, if it's anything like enemy in, the, enemy in the Mirror, and I'm looking forward to The Offspray and The Sea Wolf when I get a chance to read that, I'm sure they're going to be cracking reads, so... Um, thank you so much for joining me, Mark. I've had an absolute blast uh, talking to you. Uh, and if you, well, you know, when the, when the uh, Korean War book comes out, don't be a, don't be a stranger. Make sure you come back and see me. <laughs> thank you, Matthew. I've enjoyed it also. So there we go. I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, make sure you hit uh, the like button. And of course, subscribe if you are new and just discovering. And make sure you hit that bell for the notification. So you know every time I've uploaded a new video, so you can discover all the undiscovered authors out there. Now, to take us out, Mark has agreed to read a passage of The Osprey and the Sea Wolf. So I hope you enjoy that. I hope you enjoy our episode. And I'll see you next time. That's it for me. Here's Mark. Oh, I'd like to read a brief excerpt from my book, uh, The Osprey and the Sea Wolf, The Battle of the Atlantic, 1942. And I just want to mention that this book certainly has a lot of action in it, uh, you know, submarine warfare and so on. Uh, but I also try to cover the characters, the main protagonists, in their home uh, front uh, in the, uh, uh, at home on leave. And this is a excerpt is from a chapter that follows a long, an action series where the submarine is actually sinking Allied shipping and then the, 
commander goes home to Germany. Chapter 9, Heimat. The races or blood communities are part of the world's natural order. Keeping the blood pure means the preservation of the German people's character. The family is the eternal wellspring of the people. From the people, das Volk is constantly renewed. Walter Treisler, Nazi pamphlet, 1942. Lübeck, Germany, February 15, 1942. In his Blue Creeks Marina dress uniform, Reiner sat with his wife, Annalisa, 12-year-old son, Joaquin, 11-year-old daughter, Gisela, and his father, Gustav Hartmann, in their customary seats in the fourth row of the 650-year-old Lutheran Marienkirche. As always since childhood, his eyes turned toward the long, narrow medieval painting stretched across the stone nave wall of the twin-towered Gothic church. Completed in the 15th century, during the plague years, the painting was known as Der Totentanz, the Dance of Death. Each time he studied it, Reiner noticed another detail. Death links his bony arm around the farmer's elbow. A smiling death with a sigh hidden behind his back greets the young maiden. Bony fingers grasp the doctor's arm. One skeletal hand clutches the cardinal's robe. The other shoulders a heavy wooden cross. Reiner glanced down at his own hands folded in his lap. Noticing his fingertips were cool, he rubbed them together. Memento mori. He must always remember death is never far. The choir, accompanied by a Baroque instrumental ensemble that included his mother, Elsa, playing cello, soared with his favorite Bach cantata, Wacket auf ruft uns die Stimme, awakened at home, far from the menacing dream of war at sea, Reiner closed his eyes and swayed imperceptibly with the music. Over the past few days, as a native son and recipient of the richer Kreutz, the Knight's Cross, He'd been lauded as a hero by nearly everyone on the street. And each night he'd slept in the arms of his beloved Annalisa. What more could he ask? Encircling Annalisa's fingers with his own, he let the music carry him higher. Reiner partially opened his eyes and glanced at the Totentanz mural. With a lurid smile, death danced arm in arm with the night. An icy wave spread across Reiner's chest. When he closed his eyes again, distressing images flashed through his mind. Soot black clouds billowing over burning slicks of oil, ships exploding, burning, sliding beneath the frigid water, scattered and scorched, men screaming in the darkness. Reiner's fingertips brushed across the night's cross around his neck. How many men had died for this? Annalisa squeezed his hand and whispered in his ear, is Alice in Ordnung sleeping? Reiner pressed his body against her. I'm all.